The self-named humans were deemed by the wider galaxy to be a somewhat frustrating paradox. Humble but disrespectful, sheepish but aggressive, superstitious but godless, so painfully mediocre yet so annoyingly exceptional. No two humans were alike, but the patterns in their behavior were clear and predictable. Even if often the prediction for a given situation was, expect them to do something unexpectedly stupid. Worst of all, despite being known to us since the dawn of time, having met us as soon as we first broke the boundaries of our solar systems, the humans still had no clear place or purpose in the galactic community. And now it was my job as a leading Velian anthropologist to find and assign them such a place finally. It was widely known and accepted that each sentient race emerged under the guidance of a benevolent precursor race, possibly deific but certainly at least very advanced. Every race was infused with traits and purpose necessary for its survival, and to encompass and represent some aspect of the holy nature of intelligent creators. We Velian were wise leaders and inspiring artists, the Kurus were aggressive and fierce warriors, and the Boglings were skillful and resourceful traders and bureaucrats, even if the only thing you could trust them with was that they would rip you off eventually. Even the quiet and servile Drobolds had their place firmly established as stoic and faithful caretakers of whatever should be entrusted to them. The humans, well, the humans were a bit of everything and nothing. When the Kurus were first found by the emergent community, they promptly launched the War of Conquest on unprepared Velian and Shireling systems. If not for their innate competitiveness that led to frequent infighting between the rival warlords, the Shirelings would have been wiped out completely and we would have lost at least a third of our colonies before the help arrived. But in the end, it was the humans that brought them to the peace table, not by honorable combat, but by a rather unsavory tactic of sneaking up on their clan keeps in stealth ships loaded to the brim with planet cracker ordnance and issuing an ultimatum. However, the humans didn't attempt to conquer or subdue the Karoos, instead helping them integrate into the community as its prime warriors and also introducing them to various non-violent human sports as a way to temper and channel their aggressiveness. So humanity could conquer but weren't conquerors. When we Velian started drifting away from the community, immersed in our pursuit of higher wisdom, and immersing further and further into our illusions of grandeur and superiority, it was the humans who humbled us down and made us turn our faces to our friends again. At that point we were isolating ourselves, either abstaining on every vote in the community chambers or outright not showing up in sessions. To us, it seemed, the petty squabbles and minor disputes of lesser races were a waste of time compared to the pursuit of eternal wisdom. We cut down on trade and disallowed most foreign visits to our homeworld, except for scientists and artists, because those were still the staples of our culture, and we intended to hoard every ounce of knowledge we could get. It was the human musicians, the bright, brutish, and rebellious, metal, and punk, I think they called them, whose provocative shows nonetheless contain just a couple of lyrical lines to swap our entire course back. They sang and they shouted and screamed and they succeeded in getting through a simple idea. What was the purpose of our knowledge and wisdom and our seniority in the galaxy, if not to help everyone else, if not to lead everyone into the brighter future? especially since we believed us all to be a part of a grander intelligent design. Within a couple of months, our firm policies prevented the spread of a major pandemic among the drobold words. Thinking back to it, I can't help but feel the humans knew something we didn't. Perhaps they could be leaders, but instead they trusted us to lead. The list of examples goes on and on. How the humans famously won a class action lawsuit against a boggling shipping company even if the boggling lawyers managed to reduce the awarded compensation by nearly 95%. How the Morgnian Forge worlds were all required to employ a human engineer after the Balrog 4 rogue AI incident. To think of it, they could do whatever they wished and were likely to succeed, almost as if every holy aspect of the creators was present equally in them. It was with these confused thoughts that I started digging deeper into the human creation mythos and their theology. The multitude of their religions was startling by itself, another quirk that frustrated the scientists for generations. But like many before me, I dismissed cultural differences and concentrated on the commonalities, picking the most dominant line of human religious philosophy known to us. It was a fairly common idea. 
a deity creating a sentient species in its own image. A bit self-aggrandizing to think of it, since in reality it did the reverse thing and ascribed the supposed deity with the image of its creation. Especially funny if the image was so goofy and haphazardly drawn as the humans. Wait, I thought, maybe there is something to it. I picked up what materials were available on human biology, if only to confirm what I thought I knew about them. Right, it was true. Vestigial organs about three times as many genetic diseases as in any other race. Other quirks such as arthritis, literal blind spots in their eyes, and weird sounds their semi-liquid joints made when inadvertently dislocated. The contemporary consensus was that their evolution was purposefully left with an extremely high chance of mutation to allow for their famed adaptability. But still, that didn't get us any closer to the answer about their true place in the creation. Perhaps to know more about the humans I should access the first-hand accounts, I thought. I accessed the iBoard in my study and left a message to my human colleague asking her to call me back. She answered almost immediately, saying she would call me in 20 minutes. I rushed to get my lists of questions and references organized and sat before the screen which soon lit with an incoming video call. Ilutar, long time no see. The cheerful voice of a small woman on the other end greeted me. It's equally a pleasure to be seeing you again, Dr. Potts. I replied calmly and with a small polite smile. In reality, I was probably cheering even more than my human colleague on the inside, but my people just weren't all that expressive. How's your project going? Is that what you wanted to talk about? She asked. Thankfully, I was already used to that absurd human habit of asking several questions in a row by now. Why, yes, my esteemed colleague, it's precisely on the nature of my study that I wish to converse with you. I believe I might be on the verge of a significant step forward if not an outright breakthrough, I replied, my voice betraying just a tiny smidge of excitement. Dr. Potts laughed. I see, you're practically jumping to tell. Very well, spill the beans, since the hope of getting any small talk out of you was slim to begin with. My smile got wider, almost showing my teeth. I found the human concepts of humor, of small talk and the crude expressiveness of their speech utterly amusing. As you wish, dear Dr. Potts, I'm currently approaching the well-known inconsistencies in our theory of intelligent creation and the evidence of human, forgive me for possible offense, purposelessness. No offense taken, the human took an opportunity of my small pause to interject. Ahem. <clears throat> As I was saying, I've decided to approach this discrepancy from the point of analyzing the accounts of human creation as close to first hand as possible. Thus, I've compiled the list of questions. But the main one is, what is your theological explanation as to why you evolved like that? What is the human philosophical consensus about it? I almost blurted out. By my standards, anyway, the human would have barely noticed the change of pace in my speech if not for her experience with my people. Dr. Potts's brows went up in amusement. Dear Ilutar, I think you are definitely onto something here, but you should first look more into our scientific method itself. You know, we try to detach our empirical observations from preconceived philosophical or cultural notions to gain the most unbiased answers, she answered almost coyly. I stumbled for a second before the understanding came to me. So, am I correct in assuming that the myth of creation doesn't necessarily correlate with your scientific studies about it? I asked with a hint of suspicion. If anything, the latter almost completely contradicts the former. She laughed. The religious teachings are studied because of their cultural value, but our understanding of the world is rooted completely in empirical sciences. You are familiar with the concepts of evolution, aren't you? Indeed. I answered automatically still trying to process what she said about the separation of science from the mythos and philosophy. It was our evolutionary studies that showed the unlikelihood of convergent evolution, not mentioning complementary specialization in all the galaxy's sentience and confirmed the theory of intelligent creation. Well then, Dr. Potts said with an amused expression I had trouble understanding back then, I'll refer you to our studies on abiogenesis and evolution through natural selection. Feel free to call me back when you have the next breakthrough. Thank you kindly, Dr. Potts, for your generous contribution, I answered, still dumbfounded, and ended the call. Then it dawned on me that she indeed said when I have the next breakthrough, and was strangely confident that I will have one. 
I decided to have some rest to process our dialogue and immerse myself in studying human literature over the next days or weeks. To say my revelations had been shocking was a bit of an overstatement. If anything, I have already subconsciously accepted the fact that humans might be completely, wildly different from us in their origin. The books I had written by humans only confirmed my suspicions by placing the puzzle pieces neatly in their places. They've never been created by any deity or precursor, of course, it made sense now. Instead, they arrived on the scene spontaneously and evolved through utter chaos of multiple extinction events to survive and thrive. But that understanding left one question, though. A very simple and intuitive one both to ask and to answer, and all the more horrific because of that. If we were all created by someone who came before, except humans who were not created by anyone, could that mean... When I called Dr. Potts next time, she was greeted by a visage rather unbefitting of noble Velian. My eyes were swollen from the lack of sleep, my nails long and uncared for, my hair in a messy heap. I was shivering from nervous tension. Illatar, my friend, is everything okay with you? She asked with a look of concern on her face. Thank you, Dr. Potts. I assure you I'm quite healthy if somewhat disturbed by my recent findings. I managed to respond with appropriate politeness. But then I looked at her, and I could see she was frightened somewhat by the manic glow in my eyes. I blurted out directly, Tell me, did you create us? After a moment, her concern wavered, replaced again by that coy amusement that I'd seen at the end of our previous meeting. Huh, took you long enough to figure that out, she answered, sounding almost proud of me, despite her teasing words. But why? I managed, still in shock from my findings. To think that our mythical deities, our benevolent precursors, were with us all along, and were none other than our most goofy, most annoying, most paradoxically mediocre yet exceptional neighbors, was almost too much to take in. Guess we were just lonely, she shrugged.